Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this seminar, uh, which is organized by um, UNSW through uh, stats across campuses. And uh, this is also uh, co-batched by the SSA Stats Society of Australia, the environmental stats uh, session. So today we're uh, honored to have Matthew Schofield from the University of Otago. Uh, Matt is currently a senior lecturer. Uh, and before that, he was a, a postdoc with Andrew uh, Gelman at Columbia University, uh, where Matt was looking at uh, Bayesian hierarchical models uh, with some applications in ecology. So today, Matt is going to talk about genetic maps for genotype by sequences data, sequencing data. Sorry. Thanks, Matt, for giving the talk. Well, thank you for that introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to talk to you. It's um, it, it's a great pleasure to to be able to uh, present this to you today, albeit virtually. Um, and so. First up, I just want to acknowledge that this was work led by Timothy Bilton, who was a PhD student of mine. He um, defended his thesis about three or four months ago, um, and has then started in a post at Ed Research. And also the other authors on the talk are Ken Dodds and Nick Black, who were co supervisors uh, with me um, in supervising Timothy's PhD. So I should also probably say um, up front that I'm not an expert in genetics. So I'm going to try and describe the underlying um, problem that we are working on and give enough of a description so that uh, it makes sense the types of models we are doing and why. And I will probably make a mistake or two on the way, so please forgive me for that, but uh, I will do my best at describing what's happening. So the idea is that we're wanting to, to find genetic maps. And, and a genetic map gives us a one-dimensional representation of inheritance in a chromosome. So what we have is across the chromosome, we have a number of markers. And those markers are just positions on the, on the, chromosome, on the genome. And what we're looking at is we're trying to estimate the distance between those markers. And this isn't a physical distance. We're not getting a, a ruler and finding how far between those markers um, there is between those markers. We're trying to estimate this thing called a genetic distance. And I'll define what, what we mean by that in a few slides. And the reason why we're interested in trying to estimate these genetic maps is because they're sort of the first thing someone will do in a genetic workflow. And so they form the basis or the sort of the foundation of a number of um, follow-on analyses that we might be interested in. And so in order to understand what these are, we need some idea of inheritance and what, what we mean by um, inheritance. And so I think probably a lot of us in our minds when we think of inheritance have the following picture in mind. So what we've got is we've got the offspring down below, and we've got mum and dad. And so for both mum and dad, what we have is the darker colour is the chromosome that's come from the maternal grandparent. That, that's the grandparent of the offspring. So the darker red is the chromosome that's come from mum's mum. The, the lighter red, the chromosome that's come from mum's dad. And the picture we have of inheritance in our mind is we get one chromosome from mum, one chromosome from dad, and they form together to give um, uh, the, 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 the chromosomes for the offspring. But that's a little too simple. And so what really happens in reality is because of meiosis, what we have is that when we're inheriting that chromosome from mum, we are actually getting genetic information from both mum's mum and mum's dad. And so you can see that if we just focus on the offspring's mother, what we have is around the first three quarters of that chromosome is coming from mum's mum, 
And then there's a vent, an event that we call a crossover. That means that the genetic material then switches and it's coming from mum's dad. And so what we can see is that there's one crossover in the chromosome that the offspring is getting from its mother, and there are actually two crossovers in the genetic material it's getting from its father. And so what we're doing, and or at least the, the data we would like to be collecting, is we have this we have this genetic material and we don't know when these crossovers occur. What we what we can sort of start to think about is at various markers, and these markers are represented by those solid black lines, uh, we can think about the inheritance at those marker values. So again, if we just focus on the mother, the, the genetic information coming from the mother, so that's the, the reddy brown colors there, then what we can see is we've got five marker values and the first three of those, um, and so I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but the first three of those uh, marker values occur in the darker red color. And so that's genetic information that's coming from mum's mum. And so what we would have is the W values for these three markers are, are given as zeros because they're coming from the maternal grandparent and the marker values for these latter two, these final two markers, would have W values of one because they're coming from the paternal grandparent. And so our, our W data is either zero or one. It's zero if the genetic information is coming from the maternal grandparent. It's one if the genetic information is coming from the paternal grandparent. What we would have here for um, the information from the chromosome coming from dad is it's all coming from this lighter blue color at each of the markers and so the W values for dad would all be ones because it's all coming from the paternal grandparents. So the problem with crossovers is that we can't actually observe them. What we can observe, what we can get information on uh, is a closely related concept called recombination. And so recombination is when genetic material from adjacent markers is derived from different grandparents. And so again, in looking at the genetic information from mum, you can see that there's been both a crossover and a recombination here because going from marker three to marker four, the genetic information switches from mum's mum to mum's dad. What we have down here in the genetic information from dad in the blue is we actually have a crossover here where we're going from genetic information from dad's dad to genetic information to dad's mum and back again. So there's been two crossovers, but we do not have a recombination. Because if we look at the genetic information from marker one and marker two, they both come from the same grandparent. So recombinations only happen when we have an odd number of crossovers. Um, and most of the time that's one crossover, but at least it's technically possible it could be from three or five. And of interest, one of the, one of the core parameters in the models that I'll be describing is the recombination fraction between um, adjacent markers. And that's simply the probability of a recombination occurring between marker J and J plus one. And if we had this information on the Ws, this inheritance information where we had the ones and zeros corresponding to which grandparent that genetic information is coming from, we could easily uh, estimate what that recombination fraction is. That recombination fraction, while sort of being a foundational parameter, is not actually the object of, of what we're interested in. As was sort of suggested up front of this presentation, what we're interested in is a genetic distance. And we can think of that as how close on, on some scale or by some metric are adjacent markers to one another. 
And the way that we're going to count that distance or measure that distance, if you like, is by looking at the average number of crossovers um, between those markers. And so we're going to do that in terms of um, the unit Morgans. And so one Morgan, it gives the average number of crossovers for, for one generation. And typically what we use is um, the unit centimorgan, where centi is, is used in the typical sense of 1 over 100. So we're looking at trying to determine how close, in a genetic sense, um, the markers are from one another. And that's given by a derived parameter here that we've called delta. And, um, and so delta is a monotonically increasing function of rho. And there's been a few different suggestions for how we could obtain delta from rho. We're going to use only one of those. We're just going to use the, the Haldane mapping function. Um, and that's given by the expression on the screen. And so as well as the genetic distance between adjacent markers, uh, we're actually going to be interested in the cumulative genetic distance between any two markers. And so we're going to define that with um, another derived quantity, capital delta, JH, which is just the sum of all of those adjacent distances. So, so we're interested in the distance, the genetic distance between marker J and H. Um, a lot of the time, we're going to be focused on this talk in the total map distance. And so that's delta 1m. So the distance from the first marker to the last marker. What's the total genetic distance? And so what happens in practice when people um, come to obtain these these linkage maps is they're constructed using point estimates. So we estimate either rho or, or small delta j, and then we go ahead and we produce a map that gives us the genetic distances between each pair of markers. Um, and when that's done, people forget about the fact that rho and or delta have been estimated from data. And they just treat estimates as if they were true, and they say, look, here is our genetic distance. And there's no notion of any uncertainty underlying that. And if there is uncertainty, if we do have inaccuracies in that map, that can have quite a big impact on some of those downstream analyses. And the only real metric that, that sort of describes um, the quality of the map is that for, for a chromosome, the map distance should roughly be somewhere between 50 to 150 centimorgans. And so that, that's a fairly broad range, a fairly broad scale for determining um, accuracy of a map. And so one of the things we're wanting to do here, and, and where I'm going in this talk, is to try and come up with some notion of uncertainty in, in those um, genetic maps. So a bit of a fly in the ointment. So we outlined the data W and outlined how we could use those to come up with an estimator for those recombination fractions. But we can't observe W. So in practice, W is a, is a latent variable. And what most of the research um, in the literature does is instead of observing W, use technologies that allow us to estimate a genotype, or, or sorry, not estimate, observe a genotype instead. And um, so if we have SNPs, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, what this data looks like is we, at, at, at each marker, there's only two possible alleles. So we're thinking of Punnett square from, from high school. So if we have two alleles, big A and little a, then there's basically three combinations that we can think of. Big A, big A, big A, little a, little a, little a. And so our data that we're going to call X for the genotype is the number of 
major alleles that we have. And so the major allele is just the most common one. So if we're thinking of big A and little a, I'll refer to big A as being the major allele, um, little a as being the minor allele. And so our data just give us the number of times we have a big A. So if we had big A, big A, then our x would be 2. Little a, little a, our x would be 0. And so fairly standard model. So, so this, is, this is still setting the background here. Fairly standard model for when we have this genotype data is to look at a hidden Markov model. And so the latent state processes in terms of these inheritance values, these Ws, and unlike most HMMs that I've worked with, when we have W here as, as a hidden state, we, we have really good scientific uh, reasoning for how many values W should take and what that state transition process should look like. So we're not thinking about these hypothetical states here. We have we have um, sort of real, real latent states in mind when we're putting this model. And then we have our, our data that come in the form of genotypes at those M different markers. And as I said, this is a fairly well established model. I'm not going to go into details of exactly how that looks. Um, and, and that's been highly used and is, is very standard in the literature. And sort of where we come into this is we come into this because we have data from some of the more recent newer technologies. So some of the technologies that have been developed over the last five or ten years. And so these are markers that have been obtained using high throughput sequencing technology. Um, there's a variety of these different types of technologies that all fall under that broad description of, of high throughput sequencing. Exome captures one. The one that we're going to be using today is genotyping by sequencing. So we have gen genotyping by sequencing data. So these high throughput sequencing technologies, they have some, some pretty big advantages. We can, we can uh, get information on, on a huge number of markers quickly and cheaply. Uh, what that costs us is it costs us some additional sources of error or additional sources of uncertainty. So while we can get information on a large number of markets cheaply and quickly, it is prone to errors. There are a lot more errors in this, but, but we've focused on these two because we thought they were the biggest errors and, and um, we would start by uh, describing these and accounting for these. The first one is that we can have missing parental information. The second one is what we've referred to as a sequencing error. And so when we have high throughput sequencing data, in effect what happens is those genotypes that we just described, where we had the number of major alleles, you know, 0, 1 or 2, that's also latent. We don't get to see the genotypes. What we see in their place are these things that we call a read. And so what essentially happens is at each marker, this is my statistician's description of what happens. A geneticist would probably be in horror at what I'm about to say. But what we do is we have the alleles from, at, at each marker we get the allele from mum, get the allele from dad, we put that into an urn and then we sample with replacement from that urn. Right, or that bucket. So we're putting the allele from mum, the allele from dad into a bucket, and we sample with replacement. And what we have is there's a certain number of reads that we're going to call D, and that varies across the genome. So each, each marker will see a different number of reads. And so we might see three reads at a particular marker, and our data, which are given by Y, is the number of times out of those three reads, we saw the major allele. So we're sampling with replacement, number of times we see a big A from those three different samples. So hopefully I've got a graphical description of the process that will hopefully um, help here. So what we have is the alleles from mum are, uh, we're describing in terms of these red circles. The alleles from dad we're describing in terms of these blue squares. 
the bucket that we're going to sample from with replacement is this lower one that contains red circles and blue squares. And so we're going to be sampling out of that bucket. We can think of sampling with replacement, or we can think of there being an infinite number of alleles from each mum and dad in that bucket. I don't mind which one you think of, but we've got a whole lot of alleles from mum, a whole lot of alleles from dad, and we're sampling out of that. And so if we had three reads at, at this marker, what we might see is something like this, where we've seen two of mum's alleles, the two of the red circles, one of dad's alleles, that blue square. So just for, for, for illustration's sake, if mum had the major allele here, she was a big A, and dad had the minor allele, he was a little A, what our data would represent would have a D of 3 because we've got three reads and our data Y would be 2 because we've seen two copies of the major allele, the two copies that come from mum. So what happens when we have missing parental information is when we're sampling from our bucket, let's say again that we've taken three reads, all of those three sub might be from the same parent. So in this instance, we've taken our three samples. Those three samples all happen to be from mum. There are no reads from dad. So in this instance, our data would be, we'd have a Y of three, and again, D is three, and we've missed any parental information from dad. What happens when we have a sequencing error is when we take a read, we mislabel it. So what we have here is, if we look at, at those first two, we've, we've sampled a red circle, and we've seen it as a red circle. And then this third one, we've sampled a red circle, and we completely misread it. And so we call it yellow rather than red, or yellowy brown rather than red. Okay, so in this instance, again, if mum was the major allele, she was a big A, what would happen here is we would call this, um, this error as the minor allele. We would call it as a little a. So our data in this instance would be a depth of 3, and our y would be 2, because we would have seen two copies of the major allele. This one is a minor allele due to a sequencing error. And we're fairly broad by what we mean by sequencing error. We just mean that something's happened and, and we haven't been able to um, accurately reflect what that allele should be. So how do we extend the model to account for that? Well, what we do is we start with the base HMM that we had when we had the genotyping data. So we've still got the basic structure from before. Our state process is still over these inheritance vectors, the Ws, then we still have um, these probabilistic links through to the genotype information, but then what we have is we have another link that says that we have our observed reads given our markers. So given our markers, we've got a distribution for how our observed data, so sorry, not markers, that should, be, that should, um, that should say the genotypes. Given the genotypes, what we should have is those that read information, the number of major alleles that we saw. And so the distribution that, that we use for this, we've got binomial sampling. So given that at our marker, let's assume, I'll, I'll work through two of these. So let's assume that at the marker, both mum and dad contributed the minor allele. So the true genotype was a little a, little a. Then the probability of observing a major allele is given solely by the sequencing error parameter. So the only way that we can see a, a major allele is because we made an error in, in calling that. Very similar things happen with x equals 2. We just flip it around. When x equals 1, the true genotype of the offspring is big A, little a, and what we have is the probability of observing the major allele is, is a half. And 
the sequencing error is effectively dropped out because we assume that the sequencing error affects the major and the minor alleles equally and they essentially just cancel each other out. So when the true genotype is big A, little a, then what we're doing is out of our bucket we're sampling the major allele with a probability of 0.5. And so this model is, or this component to the model, is essentially taking into account both of those areas that I highlighted at the start. Okay, so, so this middle component here with the P of 0.5, that's taking into account the missing parental information. So the fact that we're flipping a coin each time we go and sample as to whether we pick up um, mum's allele or dad's allele, that's accounted for with this binomial term of probability of half. And the sequencing errors are accounted for here that we can only detect if the true um, genotype is a homozygote, either little a, little a, or big A, big A. And so in practice, the way we, we deal with this, uh, those genotypes are discrete. They can only take one of three values, zero, one, or two. So we, we basically sum, we, we average over the genotypes. Again, sorry, I shouldn't say markers, I should say genotypes. We average over the genotypes so that we collapse down to um, a typical HNM structure where we've got the observed data, the reads Y, conditional on those inheritance vectors W. And, and from them we can, we can uh, hook into all the uh, standard HMM tools. So we can fit the model with maximum likelihood. Uh, we can do that either through an EM algorithm or through direct numeric maximization. Um, and Timothy actually implemented this in an R package that's freely available through GitHub um, called GusMap. And, uh, and GusMap will allow you to use both of those approaches to optimize either the EM or the direct numerical maximization. And so just to give an application for this, so the data we used were data from uh, Manuka tree. Uh, Manuka is native to both New Zealand and Southeast Australia. I'm not sure whether Sydney counts as Southeast Australia, but it must be pretty close. Um, and the, the structure of the data is a full subfamily of 177 offspring. So we've got two parents, 177 children. And so plants gives us a pretty unique chance to, to look at full subfamilies, which is, which is a really nice structure for a problem of this sort. Um, and uh, have a lot of offspring for, for two parents. And, and the particular data that we're using are a subset of SNPs located on chromosome 11. Um, and the, the final data that we use, there is 149 markers. And of those 149, they're subset to, uh, into low depth markers, and there's 95 of those. And by low depth, what we mean is the read, the mean read depth, the average across um, all the individuals, the read depth is less than six. So at that marker, we're taking on average reads, fewer than six reads. And 54 of those markers are what we call high depth, where at least 80% of the individuals at that marker had a read depth greater than 20. And separating this into these Two, two categories um, was really useful. I'm not going to go into details of, of presenting the data here, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to check both internal consistency, because we can fit the model separately on the low and high depth, and what we'd expect to see are sort of total map lengths that were consistent with one another. And so if those two different map lengths vary greatly, that suggests that we're missing some features from the data. And the reason for that is that with our high depth data, we're assuming that that missing parental information is, is not relevant. Because if our read depths are over 20, there's a very, very low chance, probability less than one over two to the 20, that we're, we're sort of missing one of the parents' alleles when we, when we do that sampling. 
So um, it allows us to check internal consistency. It also allows us to check across different um, approaches for constructing these linkage maps. And, and because most of the approaches for constructing linkage maps don't really account for any error at all. So we compared our model, and that's going to have the label GM in the plots that follow, to three alternatives in the literature, um, CryMap and two versions of LetMap2. Uh, one of those versions of LetMap2 has an error parameter, so it's the only other approach that we could find that accounted for error in some way, shape or form. And so if we look at the results, what we can see is the two... So, so let me tell you what these results look like, first of all. I'm getting here myself. On the x-axis, we have our marker value here, so going up to 149 markers. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative map distance. So the total map distance is basically given by the end point here, reading across to the y-axis. And so we can see that the two approaches for calculating the linkage map that didn't account for any errors um, have done a terrible job. Basically, the, the total map distances that we're estimating using these two approaches is in the order of 1,000 centimorgans. And uh, you may remember that we talked about the expectation that the linkage map would be somewhere between 50 and 150. So those two have done a terrible job. If we zoom back into, um, so this is just a zoom in of the previous plot, ignoring those two that uh, did a poor job, we can see that the two approaches, both ours in the green and LetMap2 with an error parameter, um, so the two approaches that account for errors in some way, way shape or form, are reasonably consistent. Um, and I'm not going to go into any more detail. We go into a lot more detail comparing them in um, our 2018 paper that was published in Genetics. Um, I will just say that, that we, were, we were actually quite happy with, with how our approach performed, both with the real data and with the simulation. It seemed to be doing a good job of accounting for the errors and the errors in in the process. Sort of coming back to a point I made at the start, in both of those plots, all we had were point estimates. We could look at the estimate of the genetic distance, but uh, there was no notion of how uncertain we were in that genetic distance at, at any point. And to complicate matters, if we start thinking about, well, how would we account for uncertainty, a lot of the estimates of the recombination fraction, and I'm sorry, I'm missing, I'm missing a hat there, it should be rho hat j is equal zero, many of the estimates of that recombination fraction were zero. They were sitting on the boundary. And so, so that makes quantifying uncertainty quite challenging. And if you go and look at the literature, there's been a little bit of discussion as, as to how uncertainty could be accommodated. There's been some approaches that work in very special cases. If the number of markers is small enough or if the data have a certain configuration, then there's specific things you could use. But there's sort of been no approach for quantifying the uncertainty in, in general. So, so we basically proposed to try and investigate this using Bayesian inference. Um, and when we start thinking about using Bayesian inference, it's pretty clear that the prize are quite important. The prize are going to be important for a couple of reasons. right? One is if we've got lots of estimates uh, on or near the boundary, prize become really important. Secondly, we're interested in functions of parameters. So our interest, we've got some interest in the values of rho or the values of little delta. Um, but our main interest is in these capital delta values, so the distance between marker i and j. And, and so that's a function of the parameters that describe the model. So rho is the parameter that we're modeling in terms of, but we're interested 
in this function of that, we need to make sure that we've specified appropriate prize in that instance. And, and we can see this by, by working through some prior predictives. Well, not even prior predictives here. These are just um, implied priors on these functions. And sorry, my, my R skills mustn't be very good because my Greek symbol hasn't rendered properly in my PDF here. Um, but the first prior we might think about is we might think about putting an independent uniform prior on those recombination fractions or that recombination probability. And yeah, there are better priors to put on a probability than, um, than a uniform prior, but a uniform prior is usually not too bad. So, so let's start by putting a uniform prior on rho. What does that imply about the genetic distance between adjacent markers? And that's given by the plot on the left. And what does that imply about the prior for the total map distance? And that's what's given on the right. That should be a capital, that square should be a capital delta. And so what we can see is in terms of the adjacent distances, I'm, I'm pretty happy, right? We've drawn vertical blue lines around roughly where we'd expect these values to lie. So for the adjacent distances, we're talking between 0 and 25 centimorgans. And our prize over dispersed relative to that, but the values that we expect are, are, are sort of have high prior density. And we go, that looks like a reasonable sort of a prior. But a very different story over here. It turns out that our implied prior for the total map distance is incredibly informative. That where we expect the total distance to be, somewhere between 50 and 150, centimorgans, there's next to no prior mass. And most of the prior mass is lying between about 3,000 and 7,000 centimorgans. Well, much, much larger than what we'd expect um, that total map distance to be. And if you carry on and actually use this prior to fit the model, you see what you'd expect to see when you have an informative prior. The, the prior has um, it, it hasn't completely dominated the data, but it's certainly um, exerting a fair amount of influence because what we have is this blue line is exactly the same as the line you saw before. That's the MLE for this data. So um, this point here is our total map distance. And what we have in red, that's our posterior mean from when we fit the model assuming independent uniform priors on the rows, and the black lines are posterior draws for, um, for the genetic map. And so that's giving us some idea of the uncertainty. So yes, we've got some uncertainty, but you can see that prior has been highly informative. The MLE and the posterior distribution are not coinciding at all. And so that's obviously um, that prior, if we just put independent uniform priors on the rows, that's an unintentionally strong prior. So how could we resolve that? Well, there's a couple of ways. Well, there's probably more than a couple of ways, but there's a couple of ways that, that we considered. The first is we could specify our priors on row or on um, little delta, such that the implied prior on the total map distance was, was reasonable. And so here, what we've done is we've specified priors on those distances between adjacent markers, the delta j's, and we've specified those as gammas, such that the implied prior for the total map, the total map distance also has a gamma with a mode of 100, so right in the middle we would expect but a dispersed has a standard deviation of 200. And so if we look at the implied prior here on the total map distance, I'm now looking pretty happy at that. The, the range that we'd expect is in high prior, got high prior mass, it's over dispersed, um, so we're still going to allow the data to speak. But when we look at the prior for the delta j's that we require to get that implied prior, it's incredibly strong. We're saying that that most of the prior mass is sitting at zero, 
um, it does have a very, very long right tail. So you can see if you stare hard at your screens, you may be able to see the odd bit of mass here. We've, I've only plotted this up to 0 0.1, but those those observations here, they continue up to 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 up to 100. It has a very, very long right tail. But despite that long right tail, we're still saying that most of the mass is sitting at or at least very close to zero. So that doesn't appear to be an ideal solution. So the third, uh, the second approach that we can look to overcome the problem is to consider hierarchical models as a means of specifying prior. And so this, this is an idea that goes back to good and probably before good. Um, but taking a quote from one of Jim Berger's somewhat recent papers, talks about the idea of using hierarchical modeling to transfer the prior problem to a higher level of the model. And we can think of that by saying we've got nearly 150 row parameters that we need priors for. If we assume a common model for those, if we put a hierarchical model on those rows, let's say in terms of two hyperparameters, then we've changed the problem from having to specify 150 priors down to one where we need to specify only two. And when we do that, um, something pretty remarkable happens. And if we look at the implied priors for both little delta, the adjacent distances, and capital delta 1m, the total map distance, is we're almost getting the best of both worlds. So what we're getting is we're getting priors that are over dispersed relative to where we expect the range of the data to be, so we are letting the data speak. But for both of them, and here is a zoomed up version, for both of them sort of across um, the range of data is, is well supported by the prior distribution. So unlike where we seem to either have one or the other under those two initial approaches, this one sort of does seem to, to take the best of both worlds. And uh, I don't want to go too much into detail as to what the actual hierarchical specification is, um, other than to say we, we assumed a common distribution on the complementary log log of rho. And we did that because that was equivalent to assuming a log normal on those delta j's, on the adjacent distances. And so having that correspondence seemed seemed like a nice thing to do. Um, common model for the logit of the sequencing errors, the, the epsilons, and then our problem reduced to putting priors now on four parameters. And we chose those priors, um, the mean priors by, or at least the, the location parameter, the priors for the location parameters by specifying on the original scale and then transforming. And for the scale parameters, we sort of followed um, Gellman's approach of a weekly informative prior. In terms of implementation, we uh, wrote the model in terms of a non-centered parameterization just to help with the improved MCMC convergence that that often brings. And uh, again, Timothy has coded this up within one of his R packages. So it's available online. And if we look at the results that we get once we implement the, uh, the hierarchical model, what we can see is, is it appears to be doing a much better job. So it's not 100% the same as the MLE, which is actually a good thing. We wouldn't want it to be, um, but it's at least consistent. And so you can see, again, if we're looking at the total map distance, it's, it's very similar to what we would get with an MLE. But now we're getting some um, some uncertainty on that. And so the 90% the credible interval looks like it's somewhere just below 70 to just above 80. So we can start to get some idea of uh, how certain or uncertain we are in, in our estimation. Um, these plots, I won't go into, into too much detail, but more or less they were just um, at least for my benefit, to make sure everything was working as I thought it should. So we're just comparing the estimates that we found from the MLE to the estimates from the hierarchical model. 
And what we see is that there's more shrinkage when um, we have some of those low read markers involved. And that's exactly what, what we'd expect. And that happens both with the recombination fraction and also with the sequencing error. That when we have higher depth information, we've got more information at the marker, we don't see near as much shrinkage as when we have low depth information, uh, low, low, read, low read depth. And, and as I said, that was just sort of a making sure everything is working as it should. So to assess how well we were doing, we, we looked at a simulation, and this was quite a big simulation for um, Bayesian model fit, to be honest. So we simulated 500 data sets, and we deliberately decided to simulate the data uh, using a model that wasn't the same as the one that we're using to fit. So we made two differences. So we, we simulated the genotypes using a genetic simulator, using this pedigree sim. And then our hierarchical specification of the parameters, instead of using the logit normal for the sequencing parameter and the, the normal and the complementary log log for, um, for the recombination fraction, what we did is we assumed a beta distribution for epsilon and effectively gamma distributions for um, the adjacent uh, genetic distances. And this was purely to try and say, let's not stack the, 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 court, the, stack the deck too much in favor of our Bayesian model. While it might not be sort of apples to apples, we do want to compare between the frequentist and the Bayesian solution. Um, and so simulating with a model that was not exactly the same as we fitted was, was sort of our best attempt at doing that. And we, we looked at the simulations for three different um, number, or three different sample sizes, 50, 100, or 177, which is what we had in our data. And if we look at the coverage, we can see we've done a pretty pretty reasonable job. Um, there may be a little bit of under coverage when the sample size is smaller, but sort of nothing there that overly concerns me. We're getting pretty close to nominal coverage. Um, for both recombination fraction and the cumulative map distance. If we look at how good a job we're doing estimating, so looking at mean square error and comparing here the Bayes fit to the maximum likelihood, basically for all of these three, we've got a dashed line. Anything to the right of this is the Bayes outperforming the MLE in terms of mean square error. And, and I was expecting the hierarchical model to have um, a better mean square error than the frequentist maximum likelihood solution. And we saw that certainly for the recombination fractions in the sequencing error. Um, and an interesting twist that didn't really seem to be borne out with the overall map distance. Um, those appear to have very similar mean square errors. So, so this box is just a zoomed in version of this plot because there's some extreme values in there and we wanted to see how it looked around the line in a little more detail. So while there was an improvement in the mean square error for the Bayes for recombination fraction and sequencing error, wasn't such a big deal for the overall net distance. I'm going to skip through that summary because it's just telling you what I've just been saying for the last half hour and, and move on to a little bit of discussion. And so there's sort of plenty of things where we can go here. So, you know, one of the big limitations in what we've done is, is we've only looked at it for full sub data. And so a big question is, is how this sort of model structure with this type of technology would work under different pedigree structures. Um, and, and that's somewhat of an unknown question. Um, and another big question is, is we've just, in terms of the hierarchical specification, we just put on the first model that came to mind, and, and we followed up using the hidden Markov model formulation. But there is some understanding of recombination and the idea that if we have a recombination near a marker, then or we, if we have a recombination, we'd expect that there wouldn't be a, another recombination sort of immediately following that. So there's some idea that either 
that Markov structure might not be appropriate, perhaps a semi-Markov structure might be more appropriate, or perhaps a more complex hierarchical specification should account for some of the dynamics in terms of what we understand about the way recombination works within a chromosome. So, so there's plenty of scope there for, for looking at extending um, the models. And right from the start, I said the idea was to try and account for uncertainty in those downstream analyses. But there's a massive question mark, at least in my mind, perhaps one of you knows how to, how to do it easily, but a massive question mark as to how we could actually take um, the uncertainty that we've now been able to quantify in these linkage maps and actually integrate that with downstream analyses. Um, and I don't think, well, I personally don't think that's an easy problem. I think um, it's an interesting problem, but certainly something that's open for um, the question. And so that is, is me done. Hopefully um, that went okay. Hopefully you could all hear me throughout. Um, and I'm happy to take questions if there is time. Well, thanks, Matt. That was great. So, a round of applause for you. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, either unmute yourself and ask it, uh, put your hand up, or just write it in the chat. So, David, David has a question. Go ahead, David. Um, so I guess um, you fitted the model um, using maximum likelihood without too much drama and then started looking at the basic hierarchical approach. I was wondering why you moved there rather than sticking within the maximum likelihood uh, framework. Um, was it because you were um, worried about quantifying uncertainty correctly? And if so, did you think about ways to stay maximum likelihood and do that? So there, there's sort of two or three different answers to your question. Um, so so your your overview is correct. So we, we started in the in the maximum likelihood framework and then moved into Bayes. And, and the reason for that was, well, it was twofold. Um, it was primarily to look at that uncertainty, but also because I thought that we would get an improvement in um, in estimation due to the hierarchical model, we would see an improvement in the mean square error. And, and that's why I was a little surprised when, while we did see an improvement on the parameters, we didn't see it on the overall map distance. But that's, that's getting off topic. So going back to your question, um, the reason why we, we opted to switch over was because of those boundary estimates, that just created a real headache. And we, we looked into it a little bit, but you know most of the things we considered, it, it, we didn't think that uh, we were able to get an accurate description of the uncertainty because of those boundary estimates within the maximum likelihood framework. Like a parametric bootstrap, um, for example. Yeah, so, so for example, with a parametric bootstrap, if you have estimated a binomial probability to be zero, and you and you use a parametric bootstrap. Yeah. All of your all of your uh, simulations are going to have zero reads, right? Which obviously doesn't describe our uncertainty in the process. So um, so we thought that the clean and, and given that that I'm, I'm I typically work in a Bayesian uh, modeling framework anyway. I, I I was very keen to move over to Bayes. Um, so that was sort of the natural thing, place for, for, for me to go as well. There's a question from Grace. Hi, Matt. Um, this is Grace Chu calling in from the US, actually. Um, so I was wondering about the hierarchical specification. So in some sense, this is basically a, um, you know, a, a, almost like a mathematical device 
to get around the issue of kind of like the biases if you didn't use the hierarchical formulation. But rather than just looking at it as a mathematical device, but do not interpret it as a formulation of um, random effects, and then you can, can try to attach some sort of interpretation to the notion of your delta and your, I'm sorry, I can't remember what's the other parameter, uh, that that's basically, you know, like becoming a random effect in the model structure. A a absolutely, Grace. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I'd wanted to, to move to a, a hierarchical formulation from the get-go because uh, I, I thought, hey, look, I think that there's a lot to be gained from thinking of these parameters as random effects and being randomly drawn from a distribution. Um, and, and Timothy was a little more method. Uh, he, he, he took things step by step far more than, than I would have. I would have just jumped right in there. And he wanted to start with sort of, you know, vague priors. And so we're immediately confronted with the notion of how do we specify non-informative priors for this problem? It's really difficult. And, and, uh, and that quote from Berger's paper, I mean, that paper that, the paper that I, I cited there of Berger's, it's all about how do we specify non-informative priors when we have functions of parameters that we're interested in. And um, there, there's a few different approaches for that, but one of them is hierarchical models. And so I guess my, my presentation was I felt like the advantages of hierarchical models in terms of random effects are, are fairly well known. And, you know, I'd, I'd focus instead on the idea that they can really help with prior specification um, and sort of take what you've just said for, for granted. But absolutely, I completely agree. Thank you. Any other comments from a few? Uh, I have this very quick question. I think it's it's more, uh, uh, I guess, specific. But at some point, you said uh, briefly that you were going to use uh, a non-centered parameterization because it was going to help with algorithm. What what is that exactly? Um, so, so what that means, so, so let's say, um, I'll, I'll try and come up with a situation that's a little less complex than the one we had, but let's say you've got a random effect that's theta, and you're saying that theta has a common normal distribution. So one way, um, a centered parameterization would be to include in the model that theta is, that the theta i is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. The non-centered parameterization is to actually say that theta is, is itself determined from the mean mu plus um, epsilon, where epsilon is normal naught sigma squared. And instead of the random variable being theta, the random variable becomes epsilon. And while they're the same model, they're equivalent in terms of being the same model, their properties both in terms of MCMC or in terms of an EM algorithm, if you're going to um, fit uh, as a frequentist, uh, very, can be very, very different. So um, you can have rapid convergence with one and terrible convergence with the other. Um, and, and people have found that generally the non-centered parameterization um, is preferable to the centered in most situations. Not Certainly not all. Um, but in most situations, uh, the non-centered parameterization can help with with convergence. Thanks. That's that's good to know. Yeah, I I didn't know about it. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, final comments or questions? All right. Well, if not, then thanks, Matthew, again for giving this seminar. I think it's now 5 p.m. on Friday for you. So it it is. It's, it's, time, it's knockoff time for me. 
Yeah. So we can wish you a, a good end of the day and a good weekend as well. Thank you. And um, thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Matt. Everyone's saying thanks in the in the chat as well. Oh, very good.